Hello. I want to talk to you today about some antecedents to successful collective action. Identification with the group or the identity of the group and commitment to the group or commitment to the action are well established in the field of social ontology. To these, I'm going to add a discussion of legitimacy. That is, is the organization to which members adhere a legitimate member of some kind? That is, legitimacy is a social evaluation of the organization that members make, which will be likewise an antecedent to their commitment to collective action. For nearly a quarter of a century in social science research, particularly the sociology of organizations, we've used organizational identity much as a metaphor or an analog to individual identity. That is, typically we see this as vertical theory borrowing from social psychology. This has caused, in some ways, a debate in social science about whether organizational identity is truly a construct that can be studied, or whether, as a metaphor, it is nearly, merely a pointer to some kind of social glue in the organization. Much of the justification for using organizational identity is that organization is a social actor, much in the way that List and Pettit use it as a social actor in their discussion of group agency. Likewise, there has been a long history of the study of organizational legitimacy in social science work. Does the organization belong to a particular kind? That is, does it conform to the established norms of this kind, either in its structure or its behavior? And we would call the combination of structure and behavior in this case, the organizational form. If the organization is legitimate, that bank-like thing is really a bank, then its identity complies with the social identity of the referent type. And so once that, that token uh, is established as being a member of the type, then we can proceed with analyzing it as that social actor type. Much of the empirical work in organizational sociology holds that the members of the organization have a higher level of commitment to the group or to the activities of the group if the organization is perceived as legitimate by those members. However, we can also see that if all organizations of that kind, or all tokens of the type, are identical, that is, they all look alike, commitment is weak to any one of the tokens. That is to say, why would a member join organization A instead of organization B if they are in fact identical? This creates a need for distinctiveness of organizations within the kind. And a great deal of work has been done uh, over the last 20 years on what is called either strategic balance or organizational distinctiveness, where the organization has to have sufficient 
conformability of its attributes, its organizational form to be identified with the kind, but it has to have enough distinctiveness from the other tokens that it will attract patronage, membership, or some other kind of human action. Recent work has actually identified a two-step process of social evaluation by the members then that leads to commitment to the organization. So the conformability to type is evaluated first. Is this organization legitimate? Following the understanding by the potential member that the organization is legitimate, distinctiveness is evaluated secondly. And it, this is, of course, relative to the intentionality of the individual potential member. This research suggests that this two-step evaluative process is antecedent to commitment to the organization. Legitimacy is required for commitment, both to the act of membership and subsequent collective action by the members. Now, this evaluation of legitimacy is not a one-time event. It's actually an ongoing process if the organization is long-lived. And that organization may be a membership organization, a voluntary organization, a corporation, a university, whatever uh, organizational form it takes. Now, the evaluation of distinctiveness that is closer to a match between the individual's identity and the identity of the organization is highly individuated and it may lead to conflict among the members or at least to less than full cooperation over time. So both the first and second steps of this evaluative process are going on through time. And we would see that members may defect from the organization if they no longer feel committed to the organization because either the lack of perceived legitimacy or the lack of perceived distinctiveness to which they can identify. So commitment is well established in the literature and there are well validated scales for measuring commitments, hundreds of published studies with a relatively small set of well validated scales. One of the most important of these is three prominent commitment states affective commitment, normative commitment, and continuation commitment. Affective is easily understood. Normative tends to be about loyalty to the organization or about the feeling that they are required by social convention to remain with the organization. And continuation commitment is a very instrumental thing that basically says, I can't leave this organization. If I do, then I will suffer some negative consequence. Consider now a model of this evaluative process an existing member or a potential member to an organization has expectations of the identity of that organization. What are its attributes? How does it behave? 
then it also has a set of perceptions about that particular organization. And it will measure its own perceptions against the expectations of that organizational form. To the extent that the perceptions match the expectations, it's a legitimate organization. And we might define this as having a very small or non-existent identity gap between expectations and perceptions. There's also an identification process based on the distinctiveness that goes on. And this is that highly individuated uh, second step evaluation. If the identity gap is large, the commitment to the organization falls. If the identity gap is low or zero, commitment will be high. If identification with the attributes of the particular organization is high, that is, there's high level of identification, that will be positively associated with commitment to the organization. And this would be evaluated at initial membership and ongoing membership by the members or the potential members over time. So the hypothesis we have is that the step one evaluation, the legitimacy, the identity gap would actually be a stronger explanation for the level an individual has to commitment to the organization and its collective action. So we were going to test this actually in the field to see if this hypothesis is so. In our field research, we have studied 15 collectives of a type that are wine trails. Wine trails are associations of small family-owned wineries who would be putative competitors, but they are working together for collective action to build reputation, to build a common brand, to be a attractant to agritourism. And all of these things, the reputation, the brand, the destination value are tied to the collective identity, which is actively constructed by the members. So we actually interviewed and surveyed 110 members scattered among these 15 collectives. The wineries themselves are a kind. That is, because they are family owned, they have similar scale, similar ownership structure. They tend to be highly localized and within the membership of a particular wine trail, they're basically neighbors. Now distinctiveness within this type may be tied to specific products. That is to say, the type of wine that each member produces. Whether a member may also produce mead or distilled products or beer uh, allows for distinctiveness within the kind. There may be ancillary services beyond the production and sale of wine, which may include having a restaurant, having lodging on the premises, music festivals, whether they are accommodating to families, which obviously means that you have to have some kind of activity set available for children, because we're just not allowed to get them drunk. And one of the highly contentious ones, surprising to some people, but not to others, is whether the winery admits entrance to large groups of bachelorette party persons uh, 
who are mostly there for the drinking and not for the agritourism. There's exceptional agreements among these 110 wineries that we talked to across the 15 collectives about what the requirements for the identity of a wine trail should be. That is to say, there is almost unanimity at the highest level of agreement about 12 attributes which define the organizational form, that define the wine trail as a kind. Now there's much disagreement on these attributes that are not required. That is whether they're ancillary services, uh, whether there's a product line that goes beyond wine and the degree to which the winery is a social destination as opposed to a wine producing firm. So there's a lot of room for distinctiveness within the collective and between collectives. So there can be distinctiveness of the member wineries of a particular wine trail, and there can be distinctiveness between the wine trails as perceived by the people who are their clients. Commitment is very strong among the members when they perceive that their trail is legitimate. That is to say, when they see that their trail conforms to these 12 requirements of the type, commitment levels are very high. After we completed the field work, we were trying to understand better the levels of commitments and the reasons for that that we saw across the 110 respondents. Fortunately, some of the recent work which has been done on minimally cooperative groups or minimally cooperative behavior uh, allowed us to actually make sense of what we actually observed in the field. We found two of the 15 wine trails that meet Kirk Ludwig's definition of minimally cooperative. That is, they all admitted that they had a group identity. Yeah, we're all on the map. But we had limited relationship between the expectations for the uh, wine trail type and what the members felt the wine trail actually was. So level of commitment was very low in, this, in these two minimally cooperative groups. And the only form of commitment which was significant was continuance commitment. Yeah, I can't afford to leave this wine trail. My number of customers will go down if I leave this wine trail. I have no alternative but to stay on this wine trail were the typical kinds of responses that we saw to members who were ongoing but had a low level of commitment. On the other hand, we found two of the 15 trails that look like full-on cooperation. They are evidently highly held together by a cooperative attitude. They evinced we intentionality. Almost all actions are joint. That is to say, all members participate in all of the activities. The owners of the wineries are 
active members as opposed to passive members. The members of those wine trails send the clients that they receive to the other members of the wine trail so that they can have a superior experience overall with the group. And in these fully cooperative trails, commitment is high for both affective and normative commitments. That is to say, they feel like these wine trails are family. They feel that they enjoy the membership. As well, they feel normatively committed to the sense that it would be wrong to leave the wine trail. That I would not be able to see myself in the mirror if I left the wine trail. Now, between those two extremes, the remaining 11 trails are less easy to classify based on the level of commitment or the level of behaviors between a minimally cooperative and a maximally cooperative organization. It often turns on the level of affective commitment, which in turn is driven by how much the distinctiveness of the trail accommodates the distinctiveness of the member winery. So there are some wine trails that are not as accommodating to their members producing non-wine products. So they actually don't let new members in that want to produce distilled products or mead or something else. There are some trails which do not accommodate Disneyland for adults, having all sorts of destination-oriented activities to draw families, to draw groups, and so on, as opposed to what's in the bottle. And so we don't have the kind of statistical results that we would like to be able to sort these, but it looks more clear by the statistics that after the legitimacy evaluation, which is um, high for a large number of these 11 wineries, the commitment is driven more by the distinctiveness evaluation, the step two, than it is by the closeness between the perceived attributes for legitimacy and the expected attributes for legitimacy. In any case, what we see in practice is that the we-ness of the group and the aboutness of the group vary highly among these 15 collectives. And so we are pleased to be able to see that the various accounts of social ontology for small group behaviors are all evinced in some manner in the organizations which we have studied. It'll be a pleasure to continue with this analysis and to report back to this group in future if we can get more validation for what I've just presented. And so I thank you.